Hi, AppSec engineers. Welcome to another video of Way of the Future. In this video, we'll be talking about OAuth and specifically OAuth with the Pixie or the proof key for code exchange workflow. Let's get started. We're going to be constantly putting out content on AppSec cloud security, container security, DevSecOps, and Kubernetes security. Now, if you like this sort of content, you should consider liking and subscribing to this channel on YouTube. In addition, it would be great if you could follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. OAuth and OIDC are probably the most influential and most important authentication and authorization technologies on the modern web today. Probably a day never goes by where you're not interacting with these services through some identity provider or social login provider or what have you. Right? This is very important. And most applications today have realized that, hey, you know what? We do not have to manage our own authentication. We do not have to manage our own scopes and things like that. Interoperability makes a lot of sense. Leveraging identity providers for their specialized capabilities makes a lot of sense, which is why OAuth and OIDC have become so popular. However, OAuth and OIDC are not without their specific security challenges, especially when it comes to replay attacks, right? There have been several attacks where you've had authorization code injections or replay attacks of different nature that have compromised OAuth and OIDC workflows for several applications in the past. That's why the, they have come up with the proof key for code exchange standard that is included now as part of the OAuth OIDC flows. Now, proof key for code exchange, also called Pixie, is a protocol that helps add an additional layer of security on top of the OAuth and OIDC flows. So in this video, for the rest of the video, what we're going to be doing is focusing in on the Pixie workflows. Now, Pixie is very important, but it's also kind of a little hard to grasp. It's a little complicated. It has some cryptographic stuff and a lot of exchange going back and forth. So it's a little hard to understand. So which is why we're going to be first explaining a little bit of the Pixie to you, and then we're going to be looking at a lab, which we're going to be launching very soon as part of AppSec Engineers OAuth and OIDC course. We're going to be looking at a lab that is going to focus in on how Pixie works and actually get deep into the guts of how the OAuth Pixie flow actually works. I'm really, really excited to get started with this video. Let's get started. So in this case, let's take the same authorization code flow. So this is basically just the standard authorization code flow, except that in this case, we're adding two additional attributes to this flow. And let's explain this flow from scratch. So let's start off with the first thing where the resource owner accesses the client application. So the client application in the initial request where it's requesting the authorization server for an authorization code. So this is the time where the client application is requesting the authorization server for an authorization code first. So authorization code first and then access token next. Now that's typically how it goes. Now before it does that, the client application generates two additional security attributes. It generates something called the code verifier and the code challenge. Now what is the code verifier and code challenge? Now the code verifier is nothing but some secret. It generates some high entropy secret. Now when I say high entropy secret, it is typically generated from a pseudo random number, a number generator and it generates a high entropy string. That does not need a salt. It does not need an additional salt and things like that. It generates a high entropy string that is called the code verifier. Now, this code verifier, what happens is that it is hashed as a SHA-256 hash and it generates a base64 encoded string from that SHA-256 hash. So you have the code verifier, which is this, and you have the challenge, which is the hashed version of this that is also base64 as this one. So code verifier, code challenge. So with the authorization code flow, what the client application does is that it sends the code challenge initially. It sends the code challenge. It says code verifier here, but it actually sends the base64 hashed version along with the authorization. So when it when it's even looking to get the authorization code, it says, hey, authorization server, uh, I want an authorization code from you, but here is my code challenge. And the, the method that I've used for this code challenge is SHA-256. So it says that, hey, this is the client ID. This is 
is the redirect URI. This is the scopes. This is the state. It also adds something called the code challenge parameter where it sends the SHA-256 hashed base64 value and it essentially declares that, hey, I've signed this particular or I've hashed this particular value as SHA-256 and it sends the SHA-256 hash to the authorization server. Now, what happens from there on is essentially this. Now, the user, of course, gives in consent at this point in time and at this point in time, the authorization server obviously is in a position to issue the authorization code. So the authorization server issues the authorization code with the code challenge. So it says that, hey, this is the challenge that you issued to me. It says, this is the authorization code and here is the challenge that you sent me in the initial request. Now, what the client application does is it exchanges the authorization code for an access token. That's what we've already seen, right? The authorization code is exchanged. The last step of the flow is that the authorization code is exchanged for the access token. But this time, along with sending the authorization code and the client ID and all of those details, it also sends the code verifier. It says, here is the authorization code and here is the code verifier. Now, the code verifier is not the hashed version of the code. It is the original code string that was generated. So, you remember, we generated the code verifier, which is the original high entropy string that was generated. Now, after that, we generated the hash of that, which is the code challenge. So, initially, we sent the code challenge and now, in the last step, when we are about to get the access token, we sent the authorization code along with the original high entropy string, which is called the code verifier. Now, once we do that, what the authorization server does is the authorization server checks the client ID, the authorization code, and also hashes the code verifier to match against the code challenge that was previously issued by the same client. If these two values match, and of course, all the other values match, only then does the authorization server come back with the access token that the client uses to access the resource server. So you'll see that at each step of the way, we are adding some additional level of entropy, additional level of security, so that at this point, even if somebody gets access to my authorization code, let's say somebody captures my authorization code, they should know the original code verifier value for them to completely get access to the access token and then use that access token. Without the code verifier, without them knowing both values, code verifier and code challenge, they cannot compromise the interaction anywhere with this particular flow. And that is basically the pixie flow or the proof key for code exchange flow. Now we have our lab environment spun up. Let's start the lab itself. As always, so I'm going to open up another terminal tab here and access 8443. And we should have my key cloak server up and running and access the administration console and log in as the user the administrator of the key cloak service. Now, once I've logged in, I'm going to go ahead and create my apps. So let's go ahead and create a rel. I'm going to call this rel pkce underscore flow. Then we're going to create a client and we're going to call this pkce underscore app. Let's go ahead and do that. Now here we're going to, of course, enable consent and we don't want the password grant. We just want the standard flow. We're also going to set up the redirect URI to be our server. So let's just set up the redirect server IP, our redirect URI 5000 slash callback. So that is our redirect. URI. We're going to set our web origins to start, but now we're going to do something we've not done before. We are essentially going to set up a PKCE ch code challenge method. So it's going to say either plain, which is not recommended or SHA-256, which is definitely recommended. We're going to go with SHA-256 because plain obviously means that it's going to send the same value. So we don't want that to happen. So we want that to be hashed and then sent. So you can choose plain, but I'd recommend you not choose plain. So SHA-256 is what we use and we set it to save. So now we have saved our client. So we have our client, which is enabled with all of these different settings. And of course it has the pixie based setup as well. So that's pretty simple. Now we're going to create our user who is going to actually access the application. And this is the same user I've been using. User enabled, user email verified. I'm just going to set up the credentials for the user and set the password. So now we're done. Now let's access our application on port 5000, which is our client application. And we have our app running. All right. So now I'm going to open my app and I'm also going to open up the web developer tool so that I can examine the network calls that are happening. Now it says login to key cloak. 
as soon as I click on this button, it's going to take me to my login page for Keycloak. So you'll see that now you'll see a few things that are a little different from what we've done before. So let's look at this. So it's made a get request. So it's done the redirect to Keycloak. And as soon as it's called this particular URL, which is the PKC flow URL that we have, it says that this get request has been generated to get the authorization code. The client ID is this. The scope is open ID. So we are only using the open ID scope. This it means that we just want the parameters from the open ID, which is the email, the username, the profile and things like that. The redirect URI of course is there as always. The state parameter, so Keycloak adds a mandatory state parameter here. You'll see that the mandatory state parameter is added by Keycloak. But this time around, you will see that there is something new that has been added, which is also the code challenge. Now this code challenge is the base64 encoded SHA-256 hashed value of that high entropy string. So we already spoke about that. We spoke about the fact that initially you get the code verifier, which is high entropy string that is hashed with SHA-256 and base64 encoded. And that is what is it as your code challenge. Now this is sent to the key clock server. So once I log in, this is sent over to the uh, authorization server. In this case, that authorization server is key clock. So that's basically what's happening here. So I'm going to log in as the user and I'm going to, of course, provide my consent. This is basically just the login, the consent page information that I have, and I'm going to send the request here. So now, of course, I got the token back and you'll see I got the authorization code. And here you will see that my authorization code, we have gotten the access token, the ID token and the refresh token. So behind the scenes in this case, we have actually sent a challenge. So we actually sent our code verifier and we have our value that has come back with our access token. So let's actually look at the code. So we have our access token, our ID token, and we have, of course, the refresh token that has been generated once we have seen this sort of thing. But initially what happened here is let's look at the code and see what's actually happening. So here you will see that our, this is our application, of course, but let's look at the real, the important thing here, which is the pixie flow. So in this case, what we're doing is we're adding code verifier. We're generating os.urandom value as the code verifier, and we are base64 encoding it. So this is the code verifier and the code challenge. So we are hashing it and then base64 encoding. So we're actually URLs have base64 in this value and then hashing it and again you are using base64 it. You don't have to necessarily do that. You can use a pseudo random number generator to generate it in any, It's it just has to be a high entropy string. The code verifier has to be a high entropy string and that's what we're doing here. And the code challenge is essentially as hashing it and then base64 in whatever we have hashed. So that's basically what's happening here. So with the initial request where we need to get the authorization code, we send the client ID, the redirect URI, the state, which you saw above, of course. And in this case, we also sent the code challenge. So we also sent the code challenge. And we said that, hey, the method that I've used for this code challenge is SHA-256. So that's something we declare in the initial get request that we make to the authorization server. Then finally, we also have the back channel. Once we receive the callback, this is the code that gets triggered when the callback is actually called by the authorization server. So as soon as the callback is called by the authorization server, so it sends the authorization token along with the code verifier. So it sends the authorization token along with the code verifier. So we essentially use that value and we send the actual code verifier value back. So in this case, we get the authorization code from our key clock, which is here. We take our code verifier value and we send it back to it. And we're saying, you know what, grant type authorization code, we're sending the client ID, the redirect URI. And finally, once this comes back, it comes back with our access token, our ID token and refresh token, right? So you'll see that the access token, ID token, refresh token, have been returned, which we dump on screen, as you can see with this template. So we dump that on screen with this particular template here. So basically what our key clock server is doing at this point is that it uses this code verifier, checks what code challenge method was used. Then it SHA-256 hashes this and then base64 encodes this and checks it against the code challenge it initially received. If that code challenge happens to be the same that was sent earlier. So if the value that was generated from the code verifier that became the code challenge is the same, 
then it clearly means that there was no hanky panky in any of the transactions and that's how it knows that it's a valid flow so you can do this even on the browser even on the browser you can do the same kind of flow because even if you have this happening on the front channel in this case one of the interactions is happening on the back channel but even if this interaction is happening on the front channel it doesn't matter so much because each and every time that code challenge and code verifier has to keep changing and that's the big benefit of using the pixie flow and that's why it is considered the recommended flow with the new OAuth 2.1 standard if you like that video you should consider liking and subscribing to our youtube channel follow us on linkedin and twitter and if you want the best quality education for appsec cloud native security kubernetes devsecops threat modeling and a constantly updated library of amazing courses with amazing hands-on labs you should get a subscription for appsecengineer.com. Subscriptions are available for both individuals and teams of any size that you can access on appsecengineer.com.